Welcome all of you to this live program in Authority Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Mr. Hawar Akravi from the United Kingdom. Mr. Akravi is a consultant authority surgeon with subspecialty interest in knee reconstruction, joint preservation, and knee arthroplasty surgery. Mr. Akravi underwent his surgical training in the UK and a fellowship at the North Sydney Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Center. His special expertise is in adult and pediatric ACL reconstruction, pedal and stability, realignment procedures around the knee, cartilage regeneration, and complex multi ligament knee injuries. He established the knee reconstruction unit at Inverness and have led the development of soft tissue knee services for both adult and pediatric patients at NHS Highland, Scotland. He's also involved in the management of sports-related knee injuries for players of Highland rugby team. Ms. Chakrabi also completed a master's degree in trauma services and spent six years training in major trauma centers managing complex injuries. So today is my great honor to introduce you, Mr. Hawar Mohamed Akrabi from Scotland, United Kingdom. Over to you, Mr. Hawar. Thank you, Professor, uh, Professor Goplan, for this uh, uh, very kind introduction. Um, thank you for inviting me to give a uh, talk about this rather contentious topic and complex topic related to multi-ligament knee injuries. But what I will try to do is to really simplify the topic and reflect on my own practice um, and my patients or series which I've treated over the course of years since I've uh, become a consultant here in the United Kingdom. Right, so we're going to discuss the cases related to uh, my own patients who I've treated uh, in the past and uh, obviously we're going to reflect on the literature and uh, benchmark both expertise. Now, multi-ligament knee injury um, it's a complex entity of knee injuries um, and it has um, historically been associated with a uh, really poor outcome. Um, the definition is rather complex as well um, because there is a debate as to what um, a knee dislocation or multi-ligament really refer to. So every um, dislocation is a multi-ligament knee injury but not every multi-ligament knee injury is a dislocation and as the name or terminology is being used interchangeably. So in the context of traumatic injury to the knee, when you have injuries to the two of the four major ligaments uh, that supports the knee, whether it's ACL, PCL, or postnedal corner, postlateral corner, uh, this is related or refers to multi-ligament knee injury. Uh, historically, has been associated with poor prognosis and amputation uh, due to involvement of the vascular structures and nerve injuries and make the limb um, useless in terms of functionality. And uh, the main uh, approach to it, this has been always conservative, um, and this has always been guarded as well by a poor outcome. However, things had evolved over the last uh, 25, 30 years because of better appreciation of knee anatomy, functional anatomy of the knee, and based on biomechanical studies. Uh, we started to become more confident really with treating these uh, difficult injuries. Um, and it has been shown in the literature uh, with abundant of research articles that patients do better with surgical intervention compared to conservative treatment and uh, better diagnostics in terms of um, detecting individual ligament injury, um, availability of MRI scan, for example, has improved our diagnostics. In the context of chronic injuries, for example, we're relying on stress radiographs uh, to define these injuries uh, better. And again, better understanding of the D anatomy altogether and more awareness, uh, if you like, among the community of surgeons um, and physiotherapists that made approach to these injuries different compared to 30 years ago. Um, I remember when I was doing my fellowship in Sydney, uh, my professor, um, Leo Penceski, used to tell me when we used to see patients, for example, with knee, in, knee osteoarthritis, secondary to multi-ligament knee injury, and they've lasted probably about 20, 25 years following their injury, and uh, his statement was those who did reasonably well following this nasty injury, those who refused to have an operation, and that tells you really how uh, it was difficult to treat these injuries in the past due to poor appreciation of different factors, anatomy, uh, lack of physiotherapy, for example, and uh, the, the biomechanical studies were not as advanced as used to be in the past. So the current approach is really to diagnose patient accurately um, and um, surgical intervention patients will do better compared to conservative treatment. 
there is an ongoing debate between early and um, sort of like late intervention. Uh, however, if you intervene early, there is tendency for you to repair the structures which has been injured, but if you intervene late, you tend to be more reconstruct the structures. And uh, the work has been done by La Pride and Associate has been shown that um, uh, a reconstruction is the patient they do better compared to repair off ligaments uh, with a success rate being uh, pushed to about 80% for reconstructive uh, patient a group compared to a quarter patient who had repair, which is success rate only uh, confined to 44%. And again, there is an issue with uh, staging these operation because they're quite a big injury, could a big blow to the knee. There is again a debate about whether we should treat these patients um, as a stage approach. And again, biomechanical studies by La Pride and Associate has been shown um, there's a risk of significantly internal rotate the tibia in relation to the femur. If you address, for example, posterolateral coronary injury, and you leave the, especially in the bicruciate ligament injury uh, associated with posterolateral corner. So if you address the posterolateral corner and come back at a different time point to address the anterior posterior cruciate ligament injury, uh, the, the anatomy of the knee has altered with in tibia being a tail rotator, so the mechanics is different and the patient outcomes is going to be different with the risk of alcohol fibrosis. So that's why the approach now is being uh, uh, advocated to treat these injuries as a single pet stop, addressing all injuries in one go and promote early rehabilitation. I'll just briefly touch on the classification. So 1963, Kennedy proposed a directional type uh, classification in relation to the tibia, as where it is uh, related to the femur, so we can have anterior, posterior, medial, and lateral dislocation. But that really poorly informs about the structures being injured. Uh, Schink classification was introduced in 1994, by and large, is the classification that we use nowadays. Bearing in mind, these are really complex injuries because you can have a bit of variation. And in my own um, limited experience, shall I say, uh, it is a spectrum of injuries and heterogeneity does exist. However, this um, classification system guides your treatment. So you have, for example, a cruciate ligament injury with or without collateral injuries, and you can have medially based or laterally based injuries. The more you go down the classification system, uh, dictate that it is more severe injury and towards more knee dislocation. And obviously when you have a uh, fracture associated with that, it just makes it really much harder to treat these patients. So I'm gonna reflect on my own experience really treating these patients. I've been a consultant for five years, coming up to six years, and I've worked in a tertiary ref referral centers, uh, at least teaching hospitals, and again, a busy trauma units around the UK. And I have, We've seen or observed these patients from the demographic point of view. Um, so male-female difference is becoming um, uh, less pronounced. I, I have almost equal demographics between male and female patients. High energy injury patients, um, again, high injury injury, um, probably about 50% of them are related to motor, well, motorbike accident or traffic accident. Uh, a sport related injury, um, you can see them probably about 40%. Um, and you can see in this patient, for example, um, had an injury to his ACL, PCL, and CL and then his tear, uh, which is we classify them as a, a low velocity injury. Uh, but again, in my cohort of patients, I've noted uh, there are patients which are related to ultra low velocity or injury. Uh, injury to the knee culminated in multi-ligament knee injury. And I've seen that in patients who are morbidly obese, those who are BMI of 40 plus, and in patients who are an elderly population, just really following a simple fall. I had a patient who just like slipped in the bath and sustained multi-ligament injury with ACL, PCL, and laterally based um, uh, multi-ligament knee injury. And this is well described in the literature. Among my own series of patients, um, so I had 21 patients that are treated over the course of years. Um, and by and large, they appear to be laterally based, laterally based multi-ligament knee injuries um, as compared to the medially based, so 13 versus eight. 
Um, and if you look into the demographics and level one trauma center, for example, in Oslo published, uh, they appear to be more medially based injury compared to laterally based injury. And this really reflects the heterogeneity of this kind of injuries. Um, so it's it, it just a cohort's not matching, for example, to the one in the literature. Um, and what I found working a teaching referral uh, trauma center, there's a good number of those associated with the fractures of the tibial plateaus uh, without being a full-blown dislocation. So it's multi-ligament injury associated with tibial plateau fracture. So what are the associated knee in, uh, injuries that can happen with these uh, catastrophic uh, knee injuries there? So you can get a uh, common piano nerve injury, and this can happen in up to 25% of patients. Um, so this is one patient of mine, for example, let's see the video gonna work. So she was play fighting with her partner on the beach and uh, she ended up with significant multi-ligament knee injury to the left uh, lower limb, and you can see the high stepping gait um, due to foot drop. Although she had a multi-ligament knee injury and you can see the post reconstruction of the knee is nicely stable. Uh, this is, she's quite unstable on the contralateral leg. Uh, we laughed about it a little bit, but anyhow, so the left leg, she had multi-ligament knee, knee injury and I did stage this. So I addressed the postulateral corner and did neurolysis to the common perineal nerve, then the stage the ACL and PCL. And this is really part of the learning curve. So if you have a common perineal nerve injury as being shown by Motash et al, the risk of your common perineal nerve injury goes up to 42%, so 42 times the odd ratio if you have a laterally based injury. Now, vascular injury, if you, again, if you have laterally based multiligum knee injury, uh, the risk goes up to nine, or the odd ratio goes up to nine times that there is associated vascular injury. And in our centers, normally, we tend to rely on more CT angiogram to give us more definitive answers rather than relying on um, uh, ankle brachial uh, pressure index. Um, and and we just really have to be very uh, vigilant for this. Chondral injuries has been shown can happen in rather significant proportion. And chondral injury, surprisingly, it's appeared to happen more on the lateral and the chronic injuries more than in acute injuries. And probably this is justifiable by the fact that when the knee is injured and it is susceptible for recurrent bouts of instability and given away, so that's shearing forces can result in these chondral injuries. Uh, meniscal injury can happen up to 37%, and there's an equal proportion of medial lateral meniscal involvement. Um, and I have a patient who really had meniscal root uh, abulsion that need to be addressed at the same setting. Um, so we try to address all these pathology and treat, you know, on the same operation. Um, this is an example of one of my patients who was a motorbiker, uh, came off his motorbike at uh, relatively low speed and sustained a fracture subluxation of the knee. And uh, that I had to address both the osseous and the ligamentous component of his knee injury. So, um, so we started with the arthroscopic work and identified his meniscal root and repaired his meniscal root. And as you can see here, so this is a 4.5 uh, drilling reamer, which dictates the tunnel for the posterior uh, root of the medial meniscus. I had to leave the, um, the reamer in situ and then convert to extra articular work and elevate the depressed fragment and then buttress the uh, medial uh, tibial plateau fracture um, and and then and the idea is really to avoid cutting your suture material as you address your um, posterior root uh, repair of the medial meniscus and attach the um, distal attachment of the avulsion of the um, ACL and then did Larsen type reconstruction of the lateral collateral ligament using um, his um, own hamstring. So we're gonna go through a couple of case presentations because I just felt um, through the striking patient journey, we can cover quite a few concepts um, and principle of treating these injuries rather than giving a didactic lecture. So this is one of my patients, 83 year old um, learning difficulty teacher. He was on a skateboard and uh, 
he was um, coming down the ramp at speed um, and his leg planted and uh, stopped and his body continued the momentum over and, and sustained significant injury to the knee. So it was hyperextension type injury to the knee and the knee was forced into various. So this is him, a uh, picture of him in my fracture clinic probably about um, seven days, high surgery. Um, and you can appreciate the significant breathing related to the um, left level end. And uh, again, uh, the bruising of the skeleton to the room. So that really should set an alarm in your assessments. And this is a more significant injury rather than your um, usual um, Stop so I'm examining normally it starts with the examining the normal side and he has a degree of upper extension. But for an elevation of the big toe, uh, you can see there's a subtle external rotation at the uh, right so it was a left lower end. And this is because the tissues uh um, the corner. And clearly here, he doesn't have any door deflection and the elastic sensation for the first door gel web space. So this is quite significant injury to the knee um, and associated with dense common pronoun nerve um, injury. Um, so this is patient's imaging, as you can see, um, although the, dis the subluxation, for example, of significant injury happens to the knee, or dislocation, you know, happen at the time of the injury, but there is a tendency for recoiling effect due to the soft tissue. So by the time you see the patients and obtain x-ray, so this actually to the um, to the juniors maybe is not as significant, um, but if you, we get more distracted by these type of photographs uh, because this is more obvious and are maybe more exciting to see, but with these ones that we have, um, so the tibia femoral joints appear to be congruent. However, they appear to be fracture of the anterior lip of the tibial plateau. Uh, medially, there appear to be avulsion of the um, attachment of the um, lateral structures to the uh, fibular head. There appear to be some comminution noted of the tibial spine. So I'm thinking about posterolateral corner injury and injury to the ACL. And you can see there is a, a slight um, uh, SAG, which signifies a posterior cruciate uh, ligament injuries. So quite a few information I can get from these images. Um, and again, we'll turn on MRI scan and it looks quite more significant in a way. You can see evolution of the attachment of the biceps humoris, um, and you can see the lateral collateral ligament is just about proximally. And uh, the popliteus is completely um, yeah, significantly injured and shredded the attachment of the ACL uh, with the distal avulsion, the small fragments of bone still attached there and the PCL is now very well defined. So it's quite significant injury to read to the knee following just a, a, a skateboard injury. Um, so this is me doing EUA, so I'm looking down aesthetic. He's been defended at the speech so we can follow up his injury. So I'm trying to establish injuries with the immigrants Mr. Hamar, can I interrupt yes. you for a second? Uh, can you switch off the uh, voice of the video? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so then it's more clear. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, sorry about that. No problem at all. So yeah. you can see here the... Uh, I'm assessing the control lateral limb uh, to assess for uh, ligament laxity and or uh, ligament um, ligament injury, and you can see the significant opening up of the lateral uh, structures of the knee. Um, and these patients are usually intubated when I do the examination and anesthetics. So uh, to do the dial test, uh, prone is going to be difficult. So the patient, that's why they are supine. And in their supine position, so we we'll try to get the knee flexed to about 90 degrees or so and get knee to knee and heel to heel. And I'm here demonstrating to my assistant how to perform dial test. And, and by external rotating the foot, identify that there's more than 15 degrees of external rotation. Um, so this is suggestive of a posterior lateral corner injury. 
So this is really important to address. So the patient has coronal instability due to the lateral collateral ligament, axial instability due to posterior lateral corona, probably DS, probably the fibular ligament injury, and the patient has ACL and PCL injury. So there's a sagittal, um, again, uh, sagittal injury, uh, alignment injury to the knee. And here you can see the dial test positive on the left lower limb um, and it's being marked. So this is coming about to three to four weeks down the line when we decided to go ahead with an operation. Right, very good. So let's summarize the injury. So the injury that he sustained is as is displayed here. So he's done his bicruciate ligament injury. He injured his lateral collateral ligament, popliteal fibular ligament. He's ruptured his popliteal tendon. There is avulsion of the distal attachment of the biceps femoris. And also he has associated medial tibial plateau fracture, has been shown damages and dense common coronary nerve palsy. So this is really all from this injury which has been described. So really where to start, it's quite difficult. So you need to have a surgical strategy in place regarding the timing. Um, as I said, um, the timing um, that I advocate in my unit is around three weeks with my colleagues. And it has been shown um, that you still have, the anatomy is still relatively preserved. Um, there is a good chance for the posterior capsule to scar up. So when you do the arthroscopic work, you don't end up with the extravasation of the fluid, arthroscopic fluid to the to the posterior compartment and avoiding having or minimize the chances of having compartment syndrome. Um, resources depends really if you have access to tissue bank. In the UK, we have access to NHSBT, bone and tissue, so we can have access to tissue bank from there. Um, and it can get allograft tendons. Although in patients in which we have limited resources, we can use tendons, hamstrings from the contralateral limb. And you said this, and they need to be on board because they can help you with the blocks. Um, it's very vital for these patients to start early mobilization uh, with range of movement. Um, it can get them on CDF machine, but they need to be pain-free as much as possible. So they need to have the expertise to help with the blocks. Oh, obviously, this is not any surgeon's surgery to do. Uh, you need to be fellowship trained to do this kind of complex surgery. And because they are rare injuries, so it's difficult to build up. So it's really very important that you, for, for surgeons who are familiar with these, to be referred, these kind of injuries to be treated. And again, aggressive rehabilitation is very vital. If you don't have access to rehab, you might as well not do the surgery because the patient will guarantee to have arthrofibrosis. So there are technical considerations. So graft choice, we talked about that. It could be allograft or it could be autograft. It depends really developed countries have access to a tissue bank allograft. So it's really, it can, depends on the setup, but it can relatively easily get access to these. In developing countries, probably the tendency for more autograft and maybe more delayed treatment, initial conservative delayed treatment, and then maybe do a stage approach. So it depends really on the resources. The, consequent, the sequence of ligament reconstruction. So you need to understand um, that the idea is to re restore knee anatomy as normal as possible. Um, and this, that's why the staged approach is slightly going out of favor because with doing postulateral corner and leaving PCL and ACL for another setting, you end up with this type of knee anatomy. So prefer one singular approach to these and tunnel position and orientation to avoid tunnel interference. And uh, I will address that shortly in the next slide. Um, and graft tensioning order depends which graft you start with and how you tension them. Um, Laprade and associate has done great work um, on uh, establishing the safe corridors for, um, for, for multi-ligament knee uh, reconstruction and standably when you have multi-ligament to reconstruct, you have multiple sockets to drill on the femur and the tibia, and it's very easy to overlap these tunnels and it can cut out your graft, and that will compromise really the outcome of the surgery. So it's been very well defined and very well described, and I highly encourage you, um, those who are interested in this topic, really to have a read of these fantastic articles where it really shows uh, where the safe tunnels are for both for the medial and laterally based reconstruction of both femur and the tibia. The surgical strategy for this patient in particular, so I addressed the sockets of the ACL and the PCL, um, so the started with for double bundle PCL and single bundle ACL. Um, then, so this is intra-articular work, and again, 
for me, I've trained myself to do what I call a dry scope because I worry about extravasation of the fluid to the posterior compartment. So I tend to do some of my work uh, as a dry scope rather than using the fluid. I try to avoid using the fluid management system and rely on a gravity assisted the fluid uh, just to run into the knee. While I'm doing the arthroscopic work reconstruction for these patients, um, then move to the extra-articular work to do the tibial plateau fixation and then address the tunnels and the tibia. So we do the PCL and then an ACL. And you can see I've used a combination of allograft and tendon autograft. Once we finish the reconstruction of the PCL, then the ACL, then the attention diverted to the lateral base reconstruction. So we start with identifying the common opinion nerve and at this patient you had dense palsy. So that it was intact, it was stretched, it was like a ribbon-like structure. So it had a, a form of neurolysis. We then reconstructed the lateral collateral ligament, popliteus and popliteal fibular ligament and reattached a distal attachment of the biceps femoris. So this picture um, of the knee shows over time where we're addressing the osteolateral uh, structures. Uh, you really need to be familiar with the anatomy because again, after three weeks or so, uh, the tissues are quite scarred up and they are, there's already set into an abnormal anatomical position. So sometimes it's very difficult to tell what structure is what. So for example, in this patient, I've noted this uh, redundant uh, structure on the lateral aspect um, of the knee. And uh, just to orient you, so the leg is, so the foot is here, this is the knee, this is anterior, um, and the patient sort of like the hip joint is to, towards the proximal end of the picture on the side. So this is where you have your biceps humorous has been a valse distal attachment, and there's another structure here. So I thought that this was actually come up here in the nerve. And then further dissection I showed, so this is your fibula head, and uh, this is the proper come up here in nerve, and this is the proximal avulsion of the lateral lateral ligament and you have the distal avulsion of the biceps femoris distal attachment so it was like a shearing forces and and sometimes can you throw you really when you try to dissect these kind of injuries um, and this is just really to compare for you the lateral lateral ligament in relation to the common pain and nerve um, and the way to reconstruct these, so I tend to follow the Laprade's technique, so to address the three static stabilizers um, of the knee and the postulateral corner, whereby we used uh, two tendons, so one for the lateral lateral ligament and the syndesmosis, and the one for the popliteus and pass it through to build up the syndesmosis, lateral collateral, and the popliteus, and what you call a popliteal fibular ligament. So these are the static stabilizers that need to be addressed, and that's what this patient had. These are the postdoc radiograph of this patient, and in a way, it doesn't really do justice to the amount of work has been done to the knee. But we will visit that uh, in a second. So we could see the halo of the sockets of the um, for the PCL. You see the socket for the ACL. You see the socket for the lateral collateral and the popliteus. And because I used what we call it peak screws, so uh, poly the ketone screws. So these are radially loosened screws. Um, so that's why you can't see, you can see them in the X-ray as opposed to the screws, which are the bottom of the right corner of the image, which shows, which are made of metal. Um, so these are the double position of the, the PCL reconstruction. So I usually start with the PCL because I restore the pillar, central pillar of the knee, um, and then address the ACL, um, and then move to the, lateral address lateral structure by doing the lateral collateral ligament reconstruction and then do the popliteus or popliteal fibular ligament proximal syndesmosis and that's your posterior lateral corner reconstruction performed. So this is a patient that's him at possible uh so let me just uh, so this is about uh, coming up to about seven or eight weeks following surgery. So he's been non-weight bearing. Uh, patients only allowed to leave really the hospital when they are able to achieve 90 degrees of flexion or more. So they really, they need aggressive physios. He had a associated fracture, so I had to protect him in a brace. Um, and you can see the muscles are significantly wasted because he's been non-weight bearing on this. You can see there is uh, the soft knee, sorry, soft ankle brace, which is the one 
uh, which I think has transformed the way we treat cubopyridine injury. So this patient elected to have no tendon transfer following his um, significant injury to the knee due to come up your nerve injury because he was happy to have this splint and uh, and it's easy to slip into the footwear without any problems. So that's me assessing anterior drawer test, posterior drawer test um, to the knee and checking for tenderness of the proximal tibia. Um, and if there is no tenderness, then he's allowed to wait there. So he's allowed to walk and he's best up to walk, as I said, around the eight weeks mark. And I'm trying to test his dial test now. Um, so again, I'm gonna get um, a sort of like a, a bird's eye view or aerial view of his of his injury to the knee. And you can see the V shape has been restored. So there's no external rotation anymore. So, so this is him around the eight weeks and this is him around the seven months following his um, injury. Yeah. So you can see no, pretty much really normal, normal gait. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think that he had an injury to the knee at all. He was very held with the physios. Um, and you can see his, his, his knee is really, so it's the left knee. It's very nice and stable um, and very confident with it. And he's able to, you know, perform light jogging as well. So that's really a very good outcome following this single stage, all reconstruction of the knee and allowing patient to really have early rehabilitation. Um, and his range of movement as noted, it was limited to about 90, 95 degrees over eight weeks. You don't need to rush to take them to theater, put on your eye. I think if you just give them time, they tend to recover. And that's exactly what happened with this patient. And he elected not to have a uh, tendon transfer. He was just happy with his uh, foot drop uh, soft splint. Um, another case uh, that I encountered when I was working in, um, in Leeds Teaching Hospital, a 44 year old um, who is a housewife, sustained a um, um, car accident, she has significant BMI of 45, and she came in with full blown dislocation. Um, the common pernum nerve surprisingly was intact. Um, so is a vascular uh, tree when performed CP angiogram, but there was no injury, no arterial injury to be detected. This is summary of her injury. So it had ACL, DCL, MCL, posterior oblique, lateral collateral ligament injury, popliteus tendon, popliteal fibular ligament, and a volume of the bicep femoris. So it's quite really significant injury, pretty much all the major stabilizers of the knee. Um, the knee, the approach initially was to reduce the knee in A&E, and the patient had congruent reduction. Um, so she was treated only in a splint, not an external fixation. Um, but unfortunately, the knee dislocated on the ward because of the high BMI and the knee clicked out of position. She was taken to theater at a later date and uh, she had an application of a spanning external fixation there. And you can see the reduction is not completely congruent. Um, and again, she has a very heavy leg, so it was really difficult to get alignment right there. So again, following the same principles and the strategies. So wait around three weeks, make sure the physio is on board, make sure the anesthetist is on board with, with, with your plans, um, have access to a tissue allograft, so ordered tissue allograft to address the PCL and postulatal corner. Um, and uh, I elected not to do her ACL because she's high BMI, 44, she's not into sports or activities. So, and, and for that reason, to reduce the, really the surgical morbidity and to, to avoid having the tunnel interference. So we decided not to do the ACL. So, but apart from that, she had posterior cruciate ligament construction to start with, and then addressed the posterior lateral corner, including neurolysis. And then when we finished the posterior lateral corner, then moved to the medial, uh, medial structures of the knee, and she had reconstruction again, the Laprat technique, separate reconstruction for the superficial MCL and the posterior oblique ligament. Um, so this is really a video, um, just shows really the st step of surgery in terms of from the IR point of view. I usually obtain image intensifier of the contralateral uh, limb to see the normal anatomy and then try to make a mirror image of the structures on the other side. So this is doing the 
PCR reconstruction using uh, metal screws. Um, and then once finished doing the PCR, then address the posterior lateral corner, um, and then moved to address the posterior medial corner of the knee. Quite a few challenges happened with this patient. Uh, she was quite osteoporotic, so you can see the sizes of the screws and diameter going up and up to get good impaction and, and you can get good fixation of the graft. So her bones were quite uh, soft. Um, and again, the leg is very heavy, a BMI 45 cannot be estimated. And again, tensioning of the graft can be quite difficult with these, but you can see here, uh, there is no, no posterior sag and the tibia in relation to femur has been nicely restored um, with addressing pretty much the major stabilizers of the knee in this patient. Um, so she stayed in the hospital for a good week. Again, having it on CBM machine was helpful because um, quite extensive surgery for these patients and pain control can be an issue after surgery. Uh, so for that reason, uh, we relied on the CBM and the physios and she did reasonably well after their surgery. So, so this single uh, stage approach to address all these multilegal knee injury has uh, become the favorable approach to these uh, kind of injuries. And this has been shown again uh, in LaPrade's work. Um, the um, incidence of osteofibrosis has significantly reduced by getting early, early mobilization of physiotherapy after pretty much reconstructing all the ligaments uh, pretty much around the knee without staging them. And Andy Williams in the Fortieth Clinic of London has uh, been has again shown in his uh, publication that a good number of athletes were able to go back to return to their uh, competitive sports pretty much after 12 months following these multilegal knee injuries. However, there has been a delay in return to sport for this patient who had a bike ligament ligament injury, posterior cruciate ligament, and laterally based um, multilegal knee injuries. So multilegal injury, by and large, it's a very heterogeneous uh, group of injuries, um, and luckily they are rare, but they're very challenging to treat. Detailed evaluation is really important, and we have access to MRI scan and stress views that would help our other materium to assess these patients. It's ideally that you should aim to address all these injuries at, a, at, at the same stage, at the same setting, um, including meniscal injuries and meniscal root. Um, we need to have access to the right expertise of any statistics and physiotherapy and the surgeons um, and try to address all the structures in one go. Physio is really very important and literature has suggested with this approach, you can get really good results. And again, even for athletes, they can go back to their pre uh, entry level competitive sports. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Akrawi, for this amazing presentation. You, you can stop sharing, Mr. Akrawi. All right, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Akrawi, for this amazing presentation and congratulations for the excellent work that you're doing. Uh, pleasure, no problem at all. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Yeah, uh, let's have a short QA. Uh, now, Mr. Akravi, you mentioned about different graft options, right? You said uh, you use a lot of allografts as well. Have you thought about using the quadriceps tendon or even the peroneus lungs? I think this seems to be um, so. Quadriceps tendon, it's a it's a it's a very viable option that I've seen here in the UK, but the usage is more towards ACL reconstruction uh, rather than multiligament. I believe it's a very viable option. There. I think peroneus lungus. Uh, tendon autograft, it's still, again, a very viable option, but it's more probably popular in Southeast Asia, for example. So not much really common in the UK. And I think if you look into economically developed countries, they have easy or relatively easy access to allograft. So for that reason, it's not an issue to get access to these tissues. Uh, they're quite expensive. I mean, each graft costs about three and a half thousand British pounds. Um, so it's very expensive, but this seems to be really sponsored by the hospital. Um, I came across patient in which, um, so the management is not always easy to persuade to do these operation because they're very costly even before starting the operation. So on that patient, I relied on the contralateral hamstrings. So I used the semi-T, for example, to address the LCL, probably to uh, 
popliteal fibular ligament and proximal syndesmosis and the gracilis for the popliteus. Um, and I used his own hamstring to do the ACL reconstruction. So they did six strands uh, because you're quite a slim guy. Uh, the PCL at the time was not injured. So, so we could use whatever graft you feel comfortable with. I think in the setup in which you don't have access to resources, there's a plenty of autograph that can, can use. So that's not a problem. Thank you, Mr. Akrabi. And Mr. Akrabi, sometimes, I mean, very commonly you get the PLC injury, right? Uh, I mean, postlateral corner. Do you think a staged reconstruction would offer benefits? For example, you go in early and repair the PLC. You have, you don't have much scarring. You, the ligaments are more, I mean, you can identify it much better. You do an early PLC repair and then do the reconstruction later. What is, do you advise patients? Because at single time, so many reconstruction all together, it's too much, right? I think you're absolutely spot on, uh, Professor. Uh, totally. I think it's very demanding surgery, and these operations need to be done really with the right expertise, right setup. Um, I, I, when I started my learning curve, if you like, with these kind of injury, I used to stage them. And I've noted in my fellowship, for example, when we used to stage them, um, we tend to do more repairs rather than reconstruction. And I've seen quite a few early failures with the repair because especially in the alignment of the knee being in varus, it's just there's too much forces going through the knee laterally. So there's too much tensile forces going laterally. So it's very easy to um, stretch your repair and for it to fail. So the balance tips towards reconstruction nowadays. Um, so I learned the hard way. So the patients, which I showed you the first lady, for example, so I did a very nice reconstruction, uh, did neurolysis. I decided to come back to the PCL and ACL, but because the knee, they're still young, they're still active. They don't really comply 100% all the time with their knee braces. So the knee tend to give out. So by the time I came to do the ACL and PCL, I've noted that she has a new MCL injury. And that taught me that actually these knees are not benign, even though they, you feel that you're under control, you know, by treating them by stage approach, but they still come up with new injury. And I had two patients of these actually had to address the medial side of the knee as well. So it depends really. I think when you start, it's preferable that you get two consultants involved. So do it as a dual surgeon, two consultants, just to really to break the ice, if you like, and uh, the apprehension about it. It's much more less stressful. Um, and, at, at the, and if you, again, if you stage them, you, there's a chance that you intend to take the tibia. So that's a problem. You don't actually restore the anatomy. So even if you do PCL and ACL at the later stage, um, the knee is not behaving as normal. So patient have arthrofibrosis, still residual pain and stiffness. And what about the MCL? For example, you have a distal avulsion of the MCL. Do you think an early repair is advantages? Because you go and you have a thick, fleshy, this still MCL and you just put some kind of uh, clips or staples or something and our suture anchor. Do you think that offers something better compared to a lateral side? I think seem, the MC, the, so the medial structures seems to be more forgiving compared to the lateral structures in general. And there are actually quite a few articles shown that the medial side is structure, you can leave them and come back at a later date. And sometimes if you just leave them long enough, they will heal. So it depends really on patient symptoms and that surgery, like, you know, this patient to go back to sport. If you have a very well-defined distal avulsion, by and large, distal MCL requires surgery. Uh, Mid-substance, by and large, requires surgery. Proximal avulsion, they do not require surgery. Nine out of time, 10 times, they tend to heal, you know, with nature, if you like. So I think, I think with the MCL, definitely is more forgiving, but you need to have very low threshold to assess for posterior oblique ligament injury as well, because there are many of them are silent injury to the posterior medial corner. And you can define that by doing the dial test. So instead of the tibia dialing, so when you do dial tests and think about it on the right, so this is the posterior lateral corner here. So the tibia move forward. But if it's a medial type injury, and if you have injury to the posterior medial corner, so the medial side tibia move forward. So it's very important to address that because if you don't address that, some patients, they still have residual pain, plus minus in the stability. And I've seen that. So I tend to see patients as a second opinion in my clinics and quite a few of them, they have, yeah, the, the posterior oblique ligament has not been addressed. Thank you, Mr. Akrabi. I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for this fantastic presentation.
and I'm sure I could host you again in the future. Absolute pleasure, no problem at all. Thank you.